everyone and welcome to module 11. This is our third and final section and we'll begin our discussion on proteins. So we have quite a bit to cover today as you can probably tell by the readings. First we're going to discuss classifications and functions and then different methods by which to evaluate protein quality and then we'll examine the digestion, absorption, and transport of proteins. So first let's discuss examine classification and functions. So not only do we want to discuss the classification and functions, but we also want to delve a little bit more deeply into um, the energy function of proteins. And that will um, entail explaining deamination and transamination, alpha keto acids and their functions, and the mechanisms through which amino acids are utilized for energy. Okay, so I see I have, didn't change it from um, 2010 to 2015, but I believe the uh, protein intake hasn't, protein recommendations haven't changed. So for adults, our recommended intake is 10 to 35% of calories, or phrased another way, dependent, uh, that's individualized to body weight, um, the recommendation would be 0.8 grams per kilograms of body weight. So if you could just pause this lecture for a minute and figure out what the recommended protein intake um, for the specific individual, it's a 150 pound woman eating 2,000 calories a day. So calculate the protein recommendations using both um, methods. Okay, so you can see that with the AMDR, our protein recommendations will be about 50 to 175 grams of protein a day. So that's a huge range. Whereas when we calculate the recommendations with 0.8 grams per kilogram, the recommendation is about 55 grams per day. So you can see that's really at the lower end of the AMDR. And indeed, we see that um, on average, men and women consume about 15 to 16% of calories from protein. Now, it is recommended that we consume a diet of um, all different kinds of proteins, including plant-based foods, and high quality animal and dairy foods. However, we see that for individuals in the United States, um, our actual intake is about 46% of protein from animal foods, six, so I would say meat, I realize dairy is an animal food, 16% um, for dairy, 30% from plant proteins, and then 8% on classifieds. However, Though we only consume about 30% of our protein for fat from plants, um, worldwide the percentage is more like 65% um, from, pro sorry, 65% of protein from plants. And as we know, um, protein provides four calories per gram, same as carbohydrate. Okay, so where is the protein in our body? Well. We have a large quantity of protein in our body. So as an example, a 70 kilogram man would have about 11 kilograms of protein. And most of this is stored in the skeletal muscle, but of course we have it um, all through our proteins all throughout our body. And the distribution of the proteins in different parts of our body is dependent on developmental age. So while newborns have um, less muscle mass, as we grow into adults, we have more muscle mass. The different ways by which we can classify proteins. And there's five different methods. So we can uh, classify proteins by structure, solubility, essentiality, nutritive value, and metabolism. And we'll spend the most time on metabolism. Okay, so first we can classify proteins by structure. So here we have a basic structure of a protein where we have a carboxyl group, an amino group, NH2, and the side chain. And it's this R side chain that's really variable um, depending on the type of proteins that we have. And these side chains or R groups give each amino acid a specific size, shape, and characteristics that dictate how they're going to behave, including their solubility and their electrochemical properties. So I won't go through all of these, but you can see that um, um, all the different examples of different R groups that have um, different characteristics, such as a sulfur atom or an OH group or an acidic or basic group, and how that dictates um, what type of protein it is. 
Okay, we can also classify um, proteins by solubility. So when we classify proteins by solubility, we're basically talking about a simple protein versus a conjugated protein. So typically when you think about solubility, you're going to think, oh, is this soluble in water or is this not soluble in water? And for these protein, for this type of classification, I think it's good to keep in mind that yes, um, some of these proteins are soluble, some of them are insoluble, but basically when we're talking about categorizing them, we're talking about um, dividing them into simple versus conjugated proteins. So simple proteins are made up of amino acid units only, joined by a peptide bond. So some examples of this would be um, albumin, which we find in egg white and, of course, in our blood serum. And I'll let you read the other examples on your own. And then we have our conjugated proteins, which are proteins that are bonded to a different type of molecule. So first we have our glycoproteins and our mucoproteins. And just as the name entails, and I think we have talked about glycoproteins in the carbohydrate section, um, this is where a sugar molecule is covalently bonded to a protein. And you can see that these are prevalent in our cell membranes where we have our um, integral protein here and we have a carbohydrate chain um, attached to it. Then we also have our lipoproteins, which I won't go into much detail about because we covered them in pretty um, big detail in the lipid section. But of course, this is, includes our LDL and our HDL um, and our chylomicrons. And then we also have nucleoproteins, which are nucleic acids that are um, bonded with proteins. And we see these in um, viruses. So we also have phosphoproteins, which is a phosphate group um, bound to a milk casein proteins. We have hemoproteins, we have metalloproteins, we have flavoproteins. So you, sorry, so you can see that even um, in the great diversity of proteins that we have in our diets and in our bodies, that they can, these proteins can combine with even other types of molecules and give even a broader range of the types of um, proteins and functions in our bodies. Okay, we can also classify proteins according to their essentiality, and probably most of us are used to classifying proteins in this way. So we have our essential amino acids, which are indispensable. We must get them in our diet, just like our essential fatty acids. Our body cannot synthesize these types of um, amino acids, and therefore we need to get them from the diet. Whereas our non-essential amino acids are more dispensable because our body can use other amino acids and convert them into these types of non-essential amino acids. So we can um, so though we need the building blocks, we can synthesize these amino acids endogenously from um, if the building blocks are available. So some caveats to that are that um, our essential versus our non-essential amino acids could vary depending on our physiological state. So for example, a non-essential amino acid could become essential if we have or an organ um, fail that helps us convert our essential fatty acids into our non-essential fatty acids. So then they become essential. So an example of this would be glutamine that becomes essential in advanced liver disease. Um, neonates who have an immature organ function can't synthesize cysteine or proline. And then um, I'll let you read through the rest of these. Um, oh, actually, I do want to point out this one, that in severe stress or in a catabolic state, um, we can't produce enough glutamine to meet needs. So um, a lot of times if an individual is hospitalized, um, then glutamine does become essential. So, so again, I think most of this is review, but dietarily, proteins or incomplete proteins. So a complete protein would contain all of our essential amino acids um, that we need. And these are primarily proteins that we get from um, animal foods and dairy. 
whereas um, when we consume foods that have incomplete proteins, these foods may have some essential amino acids in them, but don't have all of our essential amino acids. And most of our plant foods are incomplete proteins. Um, however, we can combine, however, in plant foods, different plant foods have different essential amino acids. So really we can combine these plant foods and make them a complete protein so that we're getting all of our essential amino acids. So here's an example here of um, if someone was consuming a vegan diet, they could eat legumes, which were high in lysine, but low in sulfur containing amino acids. And to complement that, they could eat a grain with this legume, which is high in our sulfur containing amino acids, but low in lysine. So they can complement each other to make plant foods a complete protein. So this is kind of a guide of how you can combine um, foods that don't have a, that a complete proteins so that they become complete protein foods. So again, you can combine legumes with grains, nuts, or seeds. You can complete, um, combine nuts and seeds with legumes and so on and so forth. Okay, and then this, um, we can also classify proteins by their metabolism. So for the most part, our body knows that amino acids are very valuable and that we need to use them to build the proteins in our body that we need for um, crucial biological processes. However, if we aren't getting enough energy or if we're getting too much proteins, then basically we can use, then we can use amino acids for energy. that, we need to separate the nitrogen part of the amino acid from the other part of the amino acid. And we do this through um, the processes of transamination or deamination, um, where we're removing the nitrogen group from the amino acids. And then the carbon, and then we can be, we are left with a carbon skeleton, and this can be conserved as a um, as a precursor for gluconeogenesis. So hold on to your hats if this isn't all making sense. <laughs> or um, the carbon skeleton can be used for fatty acid synthesis. So we're going to go into more detail about this. Okay, so depending on the type of amino acid, it can be classified as glucogenic, ketogenic, or it can be both. And what um, determines if an amino acid is glucogenic or ketogenic is what we just set up here. Is the carbon skeleton um, able to be um, converted to a carbohydrate using gluconeogenesis, or is it able to be converted to a fatty acid using fatty acid synthesis pathway, or can it be converted to either, which would be this third category here. So these glucogenic amino acids give rise to um, a net production of pyruvate or some other or some TCA cycle intermediate that are precursors for glucose via gluconeogenesis. Ketogenic amino acids, um, lysine and leucine, um, give rise to acetyl-CoA or acetoacetyl-CoA. So that they can be, um, so that they can produce fatty acids. And lysine and leucine are the only amino acids that are solely ketogenic. Now we do have other amino acids that are ketogenic, um, listed down here, but these amino acids are also glucogenic. Okay, now let's transition into the functions of proteins, and you can see that we have ten that we're going to review here. So our first function is for growth and maintenance. And of course, we know that we utilize amino acids to build um, proteins of new tissues throughout the whole life stage. So we know that we need to have adequate amino acids um, available in order to grow um, the embryo prenatally and in the growing child. And of course, we have a picture here that will break anybody's heart. Um, 
of children that experience protein to energy malnutrition, um, including Quarshacor. So just a quick side note, um, Quarshacor often affects a first child when a second child is born so that they can um, no longer be fed breast milk. And so in um, environments where other high quality protein is um, not as available, cutting off this, the source of breast milk, which is a high quality protein, um, it can lead to Quarshacor. So I think we talked earlier in the semester, I'm not sure if I mentioned it, that often this is caused by, you can see, you see the bloating in the abdomen, and this is caused by a lack of these um, amino acids needed to maintain the fluid balance in cells. Um, we also um, need amino acids in order to replace um, tissue that we lose or protein that we lose, such as through burns or hemorrhage or surgery. Um, we need amino acids to grow hair and nails. We need it for the collagen in our bone, teeth, ligaments, et cetera. Um, and, and we also need it for collagen in our artery walls that enable our arteries to withstand blood pressure. We need to replace all of the proteins in our digestive tract because cells of our digestive tract are constantly being um, shed and excreted. And similar with our skin, we're constantly losing skin cells. So we need to be constantly taking in amino acids in order to, um, in order to replace all of these proteins that we're losing. As we know well by now, amino acids are also used um, to synthesize enzymes, and all enzymes are protein. Um, we distinguish enzymes usually with this ACE su suffix, not always, but um, nearly always. And as you've seen from this class, we have many, 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 many different types of um, enzymes that regulate many different types of processes in our bodies. Um, enzymes are typically specific to a particular reaction, and we've talked about that, how um, kinases typically add a phosphate group, hydrolases cleave compounds, isomerases transfer atoms with the molecule. So once you kind of start to understand the language a little bit better, or do you think, um, then you can understand what the function of these enzymes are. Dehydrogenases, we know, um, transfer a hydrogen onto um, a substrate. So we also know that some enzymes do require cofactors or coenzymes necessary for carrying out the reaction. So that we need the amino acids um, to synthesize the enzymes themselves, they often can't act alone and do need um, a micronutrient um, such as vitamin or a mineral in order to function properly. Okay, so also, um, we have the, um, that many proteins are made out, sorry, many hormones are made out of proteins. Definitely not all hormones are made out of proteins. And um, hormones don't catalyze a chemical reaction directly, but instead they act as messengers to regulate overall body conditions. And we've talked a lot about hormones, insulin and glucagon, especially um, in this course. And here are some examples of um, specific amino acids that are used to produce specific hormones or neurotransmitters. We also use amino acids to um, produce antibodies. Spilled my coffee. Nuts. Anyway, <laughs> so um, proteins are not specific to one organism. So all different kinds of organisms have some have um, proteins in common and amino acids in common. And in our bodies, we um, synthesize antibodies in response to the presence of an antigen that invades our bodies. So this antigen could be um, a pathogen such as a bacteria or a virus, um, or it could be um, a toxin from a medication or a food, or it could even be um, a molecule that most of us don't react to, but if you're, you specifically are allergic to it, um, an allergic food could be an antigen as well. 
So once we are um, exposed to an antigen, our body makes an antibody. And once it makes an antibody, it's equipped to destroy the antigen more rapidly the next time because it's already been primed to fight this antigen. And we know that malnutrition impairs the immune system. And this is one reason why, because if we don't have um, the amino acids and proteins that we need to build antibodies, then our body is not able to effectively, to fight the pathogens as effectively. So that is why we see that when pro, uh, individual has protein deficiency, they often um, also have immune incompetence. So I have a little video here. A foreign bacteria has invaded. One way the body protects itself is with small proteins called antibodies. These Y-shaped molecules recognize the intruder and bind to its surface at special sites called epitopes. When antibodies begin to cover the bacteria, it is called opsonization. This process attracts a phagocyte, a large cell that digests unwanted particles in the body. The phagocyte binds to the antibodies and engulfs the bacteria. The microbe is then killed and digested, and the body saved. That was kind of ominous sounding, <laughs> but hopefully it gave you a little refresher about how antibodies work. So basically, without adequate protein in the diet, the immune system can't make these specialized cells um, to function so that our immune system functions properly. Okay, next we have the function of fluid balance. So proteins help to regulate the quantity of fluid in cell compartments to maintain fluid balance. So this goes back to the kind of bloated abdomen that we saw with the PEM. So if our cells have too much fluid, the cell will rupture. If they have too little fluid, then the cell can't function. So it's really up to protein to keep this homeostasis um, of fluid balance. So how this works is that proteins attract water, but they can't diffuse freely through cell membranes um, like water can. So basically we have proteins. Um, so this example, sorry, this isn't in the cell, this is in the capillary, but it works similarly. Basically that the proteins inside the capillary or inside of the cell help to attract water and keep it in. Um, in the cell. And if we, we need the proper quantity of protein in order to keep the proper fluid balance. So if we don't have enough protein, then it's not, the water is not going to be attracted into the cell or into the capillary, and it's going to um, leach into this extracellular space, hence why we see this edema with um, PEM. Proteins also function um, in acid-base balance. So proteins can act as a buffer um, to ameliorate a change in pH. So we know that pH is one of those things that our bodies, again, wants to tightly control um, and um, keep a homeostasis and keep it in a very tight range. Um, and if this balance changes too much, we have acidosis or alkalosis, such as what we see and um, respiratory disorders, and of course, this can have serious consequences such as comas or death. And some of these pro some proteins can act as buffers to maintain a normal pH. So, for example, uh, we have proteins um, that can pick up an extra an the excess hydrogen in the blood, and then when we have um, too high of hydrogen or too um, acidic of blood, and then it can release the hydrogen when we don't have enough or when our blood is too um, basic. Another function of proteins is to transport nutrients um, in and out of cells, and of course we've covered this a little bit. But this transport of nutrients in and out of cells via transport protein can be switched on or off depending on our psychological, sorry, physiological um, state that warrants um, 
that more nutrients need to come into the cell or that the cell has enough nutrients and we don't need to bring more nutrients into the cell. And um, it's important to know that transport proteins don't only carry nutrients in and out of a cell, they can also um, move about, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go back. <laughs> so other transport proteins move about the body fluids carrying nutrients and other molecules from one organ to another. So whereas we've talked about transport proteins on a cell membrane, it's important to know that these proteins can travel throughout the body. And here are a number of examples, such as hemoglobin, which carries oxygen from the lung to the other cells, to other cells. And then we have the function of proteins as energy. And we're gonna spend quite a bit of time here and kind of go into metabolism a little bit. So as we said, amino acids are very valuable. We need them to um, carry out all of the functions that we just um, discussed. But most importantly, we need energy. And our body can use amino acids as a backup plan for energy if we don't have enough carbohydrates or fats. So, but we need to have enough um, protein sparing calories from carbohydrates and fats um, to power cells before amino acids are used are used because we want to retain them for their most important functions, which is making proteins. So how do we use amino acids for energy? Well, we need to break them down. So we do this through transamination or deamination. And what we do with those processes is that we remove this amine group, this um, nitrogen and hydrogen containing group, and that amine group is incorporated into urea, and that goes um, to the kidneys for excretion. And then what we're left with is a carbon skeleton with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And we know from our prior lectures of carbohydrates and fats that when we have um, this structure, we can oxidize it and break it down for energy use. <clears throat> so when we have... So there's a couple of different physiological states in which we would use amino acids for energy. So the first that we just discussed is if there's insufficient carbohydrate and fats. The second would be if amino acids are abundant, so if someone has a really high protein diet and they've met all of their needs for all of their physiological functions and they still have extra amino acids. In that case, the amine group again will be removed or excreted and then the um, remaining amino acids will be converted to either glucose or fat. However, if we have an amino acid shortage, then um, our bodies, again, will um, use amino acids as a backup plan for energy. And it will do this by breaking down um, our tissues, such as our blood and our muscle, in order to release the amino acids that are stored in these tissues and then use them for energy to maintain our um, vital organs, such as our heart, lungs, and brain. Okay, so let's talk about deamination and transamination. We know that to use an amino acid for energy, first we need to remove the um, nitrogen-containing group or the amino group. When we have deamination, we're just taking this nitrogen group off. When we have transamination, we're transferring this amino group onto a different um, keto acid to make a different amino acid. So when we talk about um, an alpha keto acid, I want to make be clear we're all on the same page here. We have the, so we have a protein with its nitrogen group, um, and the nitrogen group has taken off, and what we're left with is called either our carbon skeleton or an alpha keto acid. And this is what can be catalyzed um, because it contains the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen only. So as we said, uh, some amino acids, the glucogenic ones, can be converted to pyruvate or some other um, TCA cycle intermediate, and they can um, either be catabolized for energy or they can be um, used for gluconeogenesis. Some amino acids that are ketogenic can be converted to acetyl-CoA, and at that point, they can be used for energy, they can be converted to ketone bodies, they can be used for cholesterol or fatty acid synthesis. So we know that this acetyl-CoA is kind of one of these um, 
uh, molecules in which um, it's kind of a transition molecule. So it's kind of a common molecule between these macronutrients and helps for the interconversion of macronutrients. So when we do, so again, we have an amino group and we have an alpha keto acid that make up our protein. In deamination, we're going to remove the nitrogen group or the ammonia, and that's excreted in the urine as urea. Um, and for the process of deamination, where we're removing this um, nitrogen group, we typically use a deaminase enzyme. And so we have a little figure here where we have our amino acid, the um, NH3 is taken off, and we're left with our alpha keto acid or our um, carbon skeleton. We also have transamination, in which um, we transfer the amino acid group from one amino acid onto a different alpha keto acid or carbon skeleton, and therefore we form a new non-essential um, keto acid. So this is kind of tiny here, sorry, but let's look at this. So this is kind of like a basic um, model for transamination. So here we have our substrate amino acid, which has our ammonia group on it. And we're going to um, remove the nitrogen group, and we're left with our alpha keto acid here. But what we have here is our alpha keto, a different alpha keto acid, and the first uh, amino acid is going to transfer this amino group onto this new alpha keto acid, and we get a new amino acid. So because we were able to synthesize this, this is considered a non-essential amino acid. So basically, we're transferring um, this nitrogen group onto a different keto acid to make a new type of amino acid, and we're left with a different keto acid here. So here's an example that actually occurs in our body. Um, and this is called the glucose alanine cycle, which we will talk more about. And this occurs... Um, in the muscle and in the liver. So if in our muscle, we um, think about if we are breaking down, um, think about if we're breaking down muscle, okay, and we produce the amino acid alanine. Well, what if we need glucose at this point, right? We know that our muscle cannot um, create glucose that's available to the rest of the body. So our body gets around this by moving the alanine into the liver where it can be transaminated with um, transaminated to pyruvate by transferring its amino group onto alpha ketoglutarate to make glutamate, okay? And the alanine is loses its nitrogen group and becomes pyruvate. And we know that this can then be converted into glucose. And the glucose can then go back to the muscle and be utilized um, as glucose in the muscle. So in this way, we kind of get around, um, get around the inability of muscle um, to make glucose for the rest of the body. And we are able to um, supply glucose to the muscle with um, the proteins from the muscle. focus on the um, conversion of amino acids to glucose. So we already said that we know that some amino acids are glucogenic, which means that they can um, produce glucose. Why would we do this? Well, we know that the body needs glucose. Um, so when we have um, low glucose stores available, the amino acids can be used um, can go through the process of gluconeogenesis, or I should say the um, carbon skeleton of amino acids can go through the process of gluconeogenesis to supply, apply glucose to the rest of the body. Now, amino acids that are strictly ketogenic can make acetyl-CoA. This is a really important point. This is a key point here. So they can make acetyl-CoA, and therefore they can provide additional energy to the body, or they can... Um, um, cause uh, synthesis of triglycerides or cholesterol, but the amino acids that are strictly ketogenic and um, are converted to acetyl-CoA 
cannot make glucose. They are not gluconeogenic. And the reason is because the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA is a one-way reaction. It's one of our reactions in metabolism that is just a one-way reaction, okay? So pyruvate can go to acetyl-CoA. So we know that technically, really our um, gluconeogenic, um, our gluconeogenic um, amino acids that are converted to pyruvate could theoretically be converted to acetyl-CoA and be used for um, fat synthesis. But if our amino acids make acetyl-CoA directly and that they're only ketogenic, then we cannot convert them to pyruvate to make glucose. Um, now, amino acids that are entering the TCA cycle directly um, can continue the cycle and generate energy. Um, and we know that from a hormonal standpoint, glucagon, glucocorticoids, and thyroid hormones all increase amino acid catabolism and gluconeogenesis in the liver. And that makes sense, right? So glucagon is telling our bodies that we don't have enough energy, we don't have enough glucose. So this is going to break down amino acids so that we can um, supply A, so that we can have get more energy, and B, so that we can make glucose to supply it um, to the rest of the body. And then insulin decreases those processes. So insulin tells our bodies we have enough. Do not break down um, your body tissues. Do not break down your protein to make more glucose because we've got enough. So here's a nice figure of um, where all of the amino acids kind of enter the cycle and as far as energy production. So we can see here that we have a number of amino acids that are converted um, to pyruvate. So these technically could be um, part of uh, fatty acid or cholesterol synthesis, but they can also be used for um, gluconeogenesis. We have a number of amino acids that enter at different points in the TCA cycle and therefore can be used, um, be broken down for energy at those points. We have um, some amino acids, leucine and lysine, that are only ketogenic, but other amino acids that are also, that are ketogenic and um, also glucogenic. And these amino acids are, can be converted into acetyl-CoA that we can, that can either um, be broken um, down for energy if they combine with oxaloacetate, or they can be used to um, produce fatty acids or cholesterol. Now we also know that amino acids can be converted to fat. So once their amino group is removed and they're converted to acetyl-CoA, um, if the energy, if we um, don't need energy, so if we're in a fed state, then we can actually make fatty acids and store them as triglycerides and adipose tissue. So if we have way too much protein as our diets, um, it will be stored as fat. Now, amino acids can also be converted, sorry, I should say, we do have an amino acid that can also be converted to um, cholesterol, which is leucine, which is the only amino acid whose catabolism generates HMG-CoA directly. However, we also have other amino acids that generate acetyl-CoA, which we know can then be metabolized by the liver um, for cholesterol synthesis. Now, what about the amino group? So we know that if we have an amino acid, we need to take that amino group off in order to use the carbon skeleton for energy or synthesis of fats and carbohydrates. But what about that amino group? Or yeah, what about that nitrogen containing group? What happens to that? Um, well, we are continually producing ammonia through the deamination reaction. Remember in transamination, we don't have a net um, net ammonia because it's being transferred onto an alpha, a different alpha keto acid or carbon skeleton. But in deamination, we are continuously producing ammonia. So what do we do with it? We know that ammonia is toxic in our body. So what our liver does is it combines it with CO2 to produce urea. And then that urea is um, released into the bloodstream 
and circulated until it passes through the kidneys and then it's excreted in the urine. So we know if we have liver disease, we'll have high blood ammonia because it's not combining um, the ammonia. The liver is not able to combine the ammonia with the CO2 to produce urea. So therefore, we have high blood ammonia. However, if we have kidney disease, we have high blood urea because the liver has already done its job in making the urea, but our kidneys are not functioning properly to excrete it. So in order to keep urea in solution, we do need... Um, it we require water. So therefore, if an individual does have a high protein diet, it's recommended that they drink more water um, so that urea does not accumulate in the blood. Okay, and we also have non-protein pathways of amino acid um, nitrogen utilization. So primarily, um, most of the amino acids that we take into the diet are going to be incorporated into proteins or used for energy. However, they're also involved in the synthesis of other nitrogenous compounds that are important um, in our physiology. So one example would be um, glycine is involved in the synthesis of creatinine, ketone, glutathione, um, methyl group and metabolism, bile acids, and nucleic acid bases. And then proteins can also be used for lubricants and for other reasons. So an example of a lubricant would be the mucus that we have in our respiratory tract um, and throughout other places in our bodies um, are highly composed of proteins. And we also have proteins that surround the joints, our joints to facilitate um, movement. And then we also have proteins that participate in blood clotting and vision among other functions. So though it's kind of not considered a um, function per se, I do want to review um, one of our therapeutic, uh, a therapeutic use of amino acids to demonstrate that they can be used um, therapeutically. So one example of this would be a chemo drug asparaginase, which is used to treat a specific type of leukemia. So what this asparaginase does is it breaks down extracellular asparaginine, which and we need asparaginine for cell survival. So basically, we're introducing this enzyme to um, break down this amino acid that we need for cell survival. And the idea is that if we um, remove the asparaginine from these cancer cells, from these tumor cells, then the tumor cells won't be able to survive. And they'll die. All right. So to summarize this section on classification and functions, proteins are an extremely broad class of um, macronutrients with a wide variety of physiological functions that are crucial um, for our life. Because they're so diverse, they can be classified in different ways, and we use them for many different functions. But when we use amino acids um, for energy, we do need to remove the amino group by either deamination or transamination. Here are your practice questions to do. And we're going to move on to our next section, which is evaluation of protein quality and amino acid availability from the diet. And so in this section, we're going to talk about what makes a protein a high quality protein or a bioavailable protein. We're then going to talk about the different ways to calculate um, the quality of the protein or the bioavailability of the protein. We're going to talk about nitrogen balance, and we're going to talk about um, amino acid availability from the diet under different physiologic conditions. So what is quality, protein quality? Protein quality is the quality of the source of protein, that is the nitrogen in the protein, um, as an expression of its ability to build nitrogen and amino acid requirements for growth, maintenance, and repair. So how, um, so the, phrased another way, the quality of a protein would be its ability to carry out its physiological functions of growth, maintenance, and repair. 
and it's determined by both the digestibility of the protein and the amino acid composition of the food. So we have a lot of different methods by which we measure protein quality, and quality is determined based on the method used. So you might get um, different outcomes of quality depending on which method you use. And both, all methods have strengths and weaknesses. So we're going to go through um, these different types of methods of measuring protein quality. That is the chemical score, the biological value, protein efficiency ratio, and PBC AAS. So to get the chemical score or the amino acid score, a protein is picked as a reference and other proteins are rated relative to that reference protein. Um, so indispensable amino acids are, and usually um, an egg protein is used. So indispensable amino acids or essential amino acids um, present in the lowest quantity are defined as the first limiting amino acid in this method. And then the second lowest essential amino acid relative to requirements would be the second limiting amino acid. And generally, the limiting amino acid, essential amino acid is going to determine how um, well or how poorly a given protein can be utilized in the body. So what this type of method suggests is that supplementation with a limiting amino acid um, such as taking additional methionine with a protein that is limited in methionine or combining proteins with different um, limited amino acids could increase protein quality. So here's how we um, calculate the amino acid score. We have the content of each essential amino acid in the food protein compared to the content of the same essential amino acid in a reference protein, such as in an um, egg protein. So here's an example. If the content of lysine in a test protein is 2.5%, and the ideal level of, pro of this essential amino acid is 5.5%, then we would divide 2.5 divided by 5.5, and we would say the amino acid score is 45%. And the higher the amino acid score, the higher quality the protein. However, this doesn't really take into account how well we digest different types of proteins. So in the end, it really has little to do with how the protein is going to be used in the body. And therefore, it's rarely the only measure of protein quality that's used to rate a protein. Okay, next we have the biological value method. And the biological value of a protein is given as the amount of nitrogen retained in the body for maintenance and growth divided by the amount of nitrogen that's absorbed from that protein. Uh, so the more nitrogen that's retained for growth and maintenance, the higher the protein quality. And this does take into account digestibility because it's saying, how is this nitrogen containing amino acid actually working in our body? So a biological value of 100 indicates complete utilization of a given dietary protein. So 100% of the protein was ingested and stored and used and none was lost. Next we have our um, protein efficiency ratio and this measures how well a given protein supports weight gain divided by the quantity of protein consumed. And this um, is especially used with infants, of course, because we're um, especially concerned about weight gain and growth um, in this population. Next, we have the protein digestibility corrected amino acid score. You'll see this as PDCAAS. And this goes beyond the chemical score because it takes the chemical score and then factors in the digestibility of a protein giving it more relevance to um, how the protein actually acts in our body. Um, okay, so an example would be that if um, we have wheat, which is lysine limiting, and we have a chickpea protein that is, um, that is um, 
limiting the sulfuric amino acids, then it would have they would have um, a PDCAAS of 44 and 87 percent um, respectively. So 44 percent for the wheat, 87 percent for the chickpeas. But when we combine them together, then um, we're able, then we have a higher PDCAAS of 100% because we see that it is um, a complete protein. And here is the PDCAAS of selected foods. So you can see that we have 100 for most of our animal foods, which makes sense because we know that these have higher biologic value and are um, able to be utilized easier. Um, and then we have our plant proteins, which, um, oops, sorry, on their own have a lower PDCAAS, but when combined with other um, plant foods could have um, up to 100, a score of 100. Now, next I want to talk about nitrogen balance. So we know how to get nitrogen into our body, right? We consume proteins and amino acids. But we also lose nitrogen from our body. So, of course, we lose it when we deaminate it through urea, but we also lose nitrogen in other ways. So we can lose it um, in feces, sweat, through our skin, fingernails, hair, um, and other bodily excretions. So since it's difficult to measure all of the routes of nitrogen loss from the body, we usually use an estimate for these kind of minor um, modes of losing nitrogen. So when we talk about nitrogen balance, it's the difference between our intake of nitrogen as dietary protein and our excretion of nitrogen as urea and other waste nitrogen. So we can either have a positive nitrogen balance, a negative nitrogen balance, or ideally we would be in um, equilibrium. So first let's talk about um, a positive nitrogen balance. So if I have a positive nitrogen balance, then I'm consuming more nitrogen than I'm losing, and I'm storing nitrogen in the body. And, and this would be, um, if we had a positive nitrogen balance, this would be in cases of growth, infancy, pregnancy, lactation, burns, severe illness. So this is when I'm taking in more nitrogen than I'm excreting. I have a positive nitrogen balance. If I have a negative nitrogen balance, then I'm losing more nitrogen than I'm consuming. And that indicates that I'm losing body protein. So this would happen in weight loss, especially in a very low calorie um, diet, in anorexia, in cancer. And this really makes sense, right? Because if our body is in an energy deficit or in a fasting state, then we're going to be more likely to use the amino acids for energy. And we're going to um, be getting rid of more nitrogen via our urea. So we're losing more nitrogen than we're taking in. Now, if we're in nitrogen equilibrium, we're neither storing nor losing nitrogen. Um, and this would happen in any healthy, non-pregnant, non-lactating adult who is consuming a balanced diet. Our nitrogen balance depends heavily on caloric intake for the reason that I just said. If we're in negative caloric balance, then we'll be more likely to use our proteins and amino acids for energy and we'll be excreting more um, nitrogen. And we can actually measure the urea um, in our urine in, in order to test for a patient's nitrogen balance. Oh, I do want to say, though, that an individual who's fasting is going to lose a lot of nitrogen, but also individuals who consume high-protein diets will excrete more nitrogen. So it's important not only to measure the urine, but also to determine what the in protein intake is when we're determining nitrogen balance. So uh, this is kind of a side note um, in the discussion of amino acid availability, but we can, excuse me, alter amino acid availability um, through food processing. So we can damage the amino acids through um, different types of methods in food processing, such as um, heating the proteins, which can lead to a loss of lysine, um, when we have, or um, 
or it can make proteins become resistant to digestion so that their availability is reduced. Um, proteins can also be treated with alkali and so that the lysine and alanine residues um, react to form a toxic compound or um, the availability can be altered by the condition of oxidation. So sulfur dioxides that we consume in the diet could result in um, loss of methionine and protein. So I think where I usually see sulfur dioxides is as um, some sort of preservative. I think that's what the one that you see in like dried fruit um, often. Okay, so to summarize this section on amino acid availability measures, um, the quality of a protein is expressed as its ability to provide nitrogen and amino acids required for growth, maintenance, and repair. We have different methods of measuring protein quality, and they all have their advantages and disadvantages. However, PDCAAS is the most accurate measure of protein quality as it goes beyond um, the amino acid score and actually factors in digestibility of a given protein. And food processing um, can affect amino acid bioavailability. Here's your, protein, or your practice questions. And let's move on to our last section of the day, which is digestion and absorption of proteins. So first we're going to discuss how proteins are digested, the role of different enzymes in protein digestion, um, protein absorption and transport, and how protein digestion is impacted by physiological conditions. And pro sorry, and protein synthesis is impacted by um, different physiological conditions. Okay, so let's start at the mouth um, when protein is um, chewed in the mouth and it's crushed and it's moistened and it's mixed with saliva to be swallowed, but we don't have any actual digestion of protein in the mouth. Sorry, let me back up a little bit and do a little bit of an overview. So when a protein is eaten in general, we break them down and deliver amino acids to our body cells, and the amino acids put these body cells back together in order to make the proteins that we need. That's an overview. So first we have the mouth where we're just grinding up food, basically. And then we move on to the stomach, where we're really starting to have our digestion. So digestion begins in the stomach with um, hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid uncoils the protein strands and activates the stomach enzyme. So um, when proteins enter the stomach, we have um, pepsin and hydrochloric acid that convert them to smaller polypeptides. So that's kind of the overview. So hydrochloric acid is released in is stimulated by gastrin, gastric releasing peptide, and acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter. And hydrochloric acid denatures the protein. So I, I'm sure you've learned in your other classes that we have the um, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. And basically in the quaternary structure, which is how we consume proteins, we have, yes, we have this amino acid chain, but it's all folded up on each other. And we have um, bind, um, chemical bonds um, within this folded structure, such as like hydrogen bonds or sulfur bonds. So when these proteins encounter hydrochloric acid in the stomach, then they kind of start to unfold, which makes them easier um, to degrade and digest. Now the hydrochloric acid also activates the transition of the enzyme pepsinogen to pepsin. So pepsinogen is secreted from our gastric yeast cells in our stomach in response to food present in the stomach. And then once it encounters hydrochloric acid, it's converted to the enzyme pepsin. Now pepsin is the enzyme that actually cleaves the proteins um, into smaller polypeptides and some free amino acids. And pepsin inhibits pepsinogen synthesis. This is an example of negative feedback, right? So we have the conversion of pepsinogen to pepsin. And once we have pepsin, it's going to um, inhibit pepsinogen. 
And pepsins function as an endopeptidase at a very low pH, which makes sense because it's um, functioning in the presence of hydrochloric acid. And an endopeptidase, just like we would assume from the name of it, um, works on peptide bonds within the polypeptide chain. Um, after the protein has been broken down by pepsin, the end product is an acid chyme, which is going to move into the um, duodenum. So once the acid chyme um, enters the duodenum, it stimulates cholecystokinin and secretin hormones to be released from the endocrine cells, from the mucosal endocrine cells. So these hormones are carried by the blood to the pancreas, which secretes pancreatic juice and digestive proenzymes. These enzymes then split our polypeptides even further. So they break down these polypeptides um, from the stomach into dipeptides, tripeptides, and free amino acids. And then um, the enzyme, or I'm sorry, and then these dipeptides tri and tripeptides are further broken down by enzymes on the small enzyme surface or on the endothelial surface um, that breaks them down even further so that they can be absorbed as free amino acids. So these proenzymes that are secreted by um, the pancreas are, um, include a number of different enzymes. So what a proenzyme pro is, you also may see it um, labeled as a zymogen or an inactive enzyme, and it, that's what it is. It's the inactive form of these enzymes. So the pancreas secretes these inactive forms of these enzymes, trypsinogen, chemotrypsinogen, or procarboxypeptidases, proelastase and collagenase. <laughs> Sorry, some of these are tongue twisters. So within the small intestine, these inactive proenzymes need to be activated so that they break down um, these polypeptides. So this process begins with the conversion of trypsinogen to trypsin by um, an enteropeptidase or enterokinase enzyme. And this enzyme, this enteropeptidase, is secreted at the brush border of the enzyme of the small intestine in response to CCK and secretin. Now, once we form trypsin, we start this cascade of um, converting these inactive enzymes to their active form. So once we have trypsin, we can convert chemotrypsinogen to chemotrypsin, which is its active form. We can convert the procarboxypeptidases to the carboxypeptidases, which is their active form. We convert proelastase to elastase, which is its active form. And all of these active um, enzymes are, again, endopeptidases that can break down these um, polypeptides. And then we do have um, other peptidases at the small intestine um, brush border as well. So once our proteins have encountered all of these peptidases, we're left with dipeptides, tripeptides, and free amino acids. And these are absorbed across the brush border um, of the intestinal epithelium by specific carriers through a variety of transport mechanisms, depending on um, the characteristics of the amino acids, dipeptides, or tripeptides. So I want to go into a little bit um, more depth about these enzymes that we find that are secreted by the pancreas and then converted to their active form in the small intestine. So first we have trypsin. Again, we have negative feedback inhibition where it inhibits trypsinogen. And this um, enzyme cleaves the peptide bonds next to specific amino acids. And trypsin is also used, as we saw, to convert many proenzymes to their active forms. Next, we have 
chymotrypsin, which again, cleaves peptide bonds at very specific, um, next to very specific amino acids. We have our carboxypeptidases, which again, cleave amino acids at a very specific point, uh, and they are um, zinc dependent. We have elastase and collagenase, which cleave polypeptides into smaller polypeptides and tripeptides. We have aminopeptidases, which cleave amino acids um, from the ends of dipeptides. So this is, um, a, remember, these are at the um, fresh border of the small intestine. So basically, we're just trying to break them down smaller and smaller and smaller so that they can be absorbed as free amino acids um, into the enterocyte. And then here's a table that's an overview of um, the enzymes, some of the enzymes responsible for um, protein digestion. Let you do those final ones on your own. Okay, so here is an overview of protein digestion. So let's walk through it. So here we have our amino acid and protein fragments from um, digestion in our stomach, from um, pepsin, and pe uh, from pepsin um, and hydrochloric acid. Here we have, this is our lumen here. This is our absorptive or, epithel or um, epithelial cell in our small intestine. So first, proteins and protein fragments are digested to free amino acids by our pancreatic proteases and by brush border enzymes into so that they are um, broken down to free amino acids here. Second, the amino acids are absorbed by my mouse by active transport into. I'm sorry. These are the um, enzymes. These are the free amino acids, and these are transported by active transport into um, the absorptive cell, and then move to the other side of the absorptive cell. And then the amino acids leave the epithelial cell, excuse me, I'm gonna pause this in a second and plug in, through the epithelial cell and um, through facilitated diffusion, and then they enter our capillary. I'm gonna stop this and plug in real quick. Okay. Okay, so here is an overview of protein digestion. So food enters the stomach, um, gastric mucosa are stimulated, Chief cells release pepsinogen, um, gastrin is released, HCL is secreted, HCL denatures the proteins and causes the transition of um, pepsinogen to pepsin. Pepsin breaks down the amino acid chains um, and starts to hydrolyze um, the proteins. These smaller peptides then go are released into the duodenum in our chyme. This food releases, um, causes the release of secretin and of cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin causes the release of our proenzymes from our pancreas. Um, it also releases secretin, which then um, causes the release of bicarbonate from the pancreas so that it raises the pH of um, the acid chyme in their duodenum. And then, um, these, I'm sorry, then these proenzymes are um, converted to their active form through trypsin. So once trypsinogen is um, activated to trypsin by enteropeptidase that is located um, in the small intestine and is stimulated by secretin and CCK, then once trypsin is um, formed, then it stimulates the conversion of our other proenzymes to their active form. And then once we have the active form of the, these enzymes, they degrade the proteins into even smaller peptides, and then we have um, dipeptides, tripeptides, and eventually free amino acids that are absorbed into the blood, into the portal vein, and go to the liver. So here is again a nice overview. Um, that I will let you walk through yourself because it's basically what we just went over. Okay, so now let's talk about absorption and transport. Now, we just talked about that when amino acids are absorbed into the enterocyte, then they go um, to the other side of the enterocyte, the 
um, basal lateral membrane and they're absorbed into the portal vein. But one caveat to that is that some amino acids are retained in the enterocyte for the enterocyte's needs. We know that we're constantly losing um, cells in our small intestine. They're being sloughed off and excreted. So our enterocyte, and of course our enterocyte has um, uh, many proteins just like any other cell. So sometimes they, um, so they do retain some amino acids for their needs. However, all the rest of them go to the liver, and they form this pool of free amino acids. Then the free amino acids are distributed to all of the tissues, especially the mu muscles, where they're built into proteins. So once amino acids are in the blood and taken to the liver, one of three things can happen. So that was just kind of an overview before. So once the amino acids are taken to the liver, one of three things happen. They form part of an amino acid pool in the liver. They're used to synthesize liver proteins or other proteins that are exported into the blood. So they're used to synthesize proteins in the liver that are then exported in the blood. Or they can, if we have excess amino acids, they can be broken down in the liver and utilized for energy. So here's an overview of that. So here we have our amino acids in the liver. They're taken to the portal vein after they're absorbed by the enterocyte. And we know that um, they can be used to form liver proteins that are either used in the liver or excreted into the plasma, such as albumin. These free amino acids can also um, go into the blood and into the muscles and other tissues to be um, used to synthesize other proteins. We also talked about our non, our um, other pathways by which we utilize these nitrogen compounds to uh, make thing, make uh, molecules such as nucleotides. And then we also talked in depth about how they can be broken down for energy. So. Um, some of them are converted to pyruvate, which can be used for um, gluconeogenesis. Some of them can be converted to acetyl-CoA, which can be used as fat for fatty acid synthesis, or both of these can be broken down um, in the TCA cycle for energy. So for absorption and transport of proteins, we basically have seven steps. We have absorption of the free amino acids um, following digestion. We have uptake by the liver. We have synthesis of liver and plasma proteins, catabolism of extra amino acids, distribution of amino acids to the rest of the body, uptake by the muscle, pancreas, and other tissues. And then we have excretion of our nitrogen in various forms. So our body is really efficient at utilizing our proteins and amino acids. So our body knows how valuable these um, proteins are, are. So for 170 grams of, pro of amino acids or proteins entering the GI tract, almost 160 grams are reabsorbed um, as free amino acids or small peptides. So you can see we are highly efficient at absorbing amino acids. And we also can retain a lot of our proteins. We can recycle them. So for instance, um, an example would be our digestive enzymes that are degraded in the digestive tract. Okay, so once our body says, okay, I don't really need this digestive enzyme anymore, let's degrade it, then those amino acids can be recycled and we can use them to build other proteins that our body needs. So um, our liver is the main or only source of degradation of most of our essential amino acids, except for branched chain amino acids whose catabolism occurs mostly in the muscle. Okay, so how is this protein synthesis and degradation regulated? And we're gonna go into much more depth about protein synthesis next week. Um, so protein synthesis in the liver um, and muscle are very sensitive to protein influx. So basically, if I have protein coming in, I want to use it to synthesize the proteins in my body that I need. And this is mediated by insulin in response to amino acid or glucose influx. 
So if I eat protein or I eat glucose, I, my body is going to produce insulin and that is going to cause um, my body to synthesize proteins from the amino acids that I have digested. Now, insulin also enhances transport of the amino acids, and therefore it has an important effect on protein synthesis in different parts of our body. So muscle protein is the largest reserve of amino acids from which we can draw it in times of need when we don't have adequate um, carbohydrate or fat. And this would occur in situations such as fasting, starvation, or um, using a substantial, where we would use a substantial portion of our amino acids for gluconeogenesis. So after a meal, the influx of amino acid um, results in a surge in protein synthesis, both in our liver and in our muscle, and a degradation to excess amino acids um, to glucose as precursors or um, to acetyl-CoA. So let's think about insulin. So we talk, let's go back to carbohydrates and fats, right? When we talked about carbohydrates, insulin affected glucose by trying to get rid, by trying to decrease glucose levels in the blood, right? So it would do this by building up glucose to glycogen or breaking down glucose for energy by oxidizing it. We saw the same thing with um, fatty acids, that when we have insulin, we'll either build them up in our adipose tissue um, or we'll break them down through beta oxidation. Basically, we're trying to get rid of, uh, decrease the levels in our blood. Same thing for amino acids. If I have a lot of amino acids in my bloodstream, then my body says, okay, what can I do to decrease these levels of amino acids? This is what insulin is telling us. So we're either going to build it up by protein synthesis, or we're going to break it down by oxidizing it, or um, by storing it in the form of triglycerides or glycogen. So after we've taken in these amino acids and um, our body has kind of decreased our levels of amino acids in our blood, I've made my proteins, I've broken down my proteins, I've made some fat, then um, the process is going to slow down just like any um, process after our and post absorption, right? So once after we have the meal and a couple hours have passed and our insulin levels and glucagon begins to take over. And when glucagon starts to take over, then we have a re net release of amino acids from our body and especially from our muscle as fasting um, begins and progresses. However, so that's in the beginning stages of fasting, such as um, you know, in long stretches between meals, like when I'm sleeping, for instance. However, our body in its infinite wisdom once we get um, into severe fasting state, then our body is able to further adapt so that it can um, conserve amino acids once again, um, reducing the need for muscle breakdown. And again, we're going to go into a lot more detail about this next week. Okay, so I have a little summary here. Protein digestion. Oh, no. Okay, well, I'll fix that before I post um, this onto the portal, and then you can um, watch it yourself. So in summary, the digestion of proteins begins in the stomach, continues throughout, this continues in the small intestine, especially with enzymes from the pancreas, and then degrades proteins into um, free amino acids, dipeptides, and tripeptides. These are then absorbed into the enterocyte and released in the bloodstream and delivered into the liver where they form an amino acid pool used to make proteins or they're degraded and used for energy and or they can be converted into um, glucose or fatty acids. And protein synthesis is sensitive to protein influx. So here are your practice questions. And um, of course, if you have any questions, you can contact me. Otherwise, I will talk to you next week.